Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. I want to have my friend David Kinteri from Money GPS. He has a very large YouTube channel on finance, been doing it for over a decade, also has the book Money GPS. I want to get his thoughts on all this stuff coming out with FTX and the Centralized Cryptocurrencies Exchange. David, do you think that this effect, it, the main cause of it, are the interest rate increases that the Federal Reserve Bank is doing and it's causing all these frauds to be exposed. Absolutely, 100%. There's no question about it. And you look at this and you say, FTX is the problem. Sam Bankman Freed is the problem. It's not really. It's that there are a symptom of what we've been dealing with for basically since the financial crisis, or if you want to go back even further, 1971. But essentially, all these companies are taking advantage of this super cheap debt. And that's what they all do. They're all financed by this crazy debt. And then you find out about one exchange here, one bad company there. And you say, look, that's the bad guy. He's the evil guy. Look, I saw his picture on on, on the website and he's he's the one. But if the interest rates were at a normal level and we didn't print money to all eternity, well, you would have a different story. And the one that I like to bring up is Tesla. Because if you look at what happened with Tesla 2018 into 2019, and then what happened 2019 into 2020, 2021, this stock starts going straight up through the roof. Did they sell like correspondingly that amount of vehicles? Did they create something new and revolutionary? No. They're a company that's selling a lot of cars. They've got a lot of revenue coming in. Absolutely, the stock can go up. But if it goes parabolic, you know that it's based on speculation rather than actual fundamentals. So you saw what happened with Tesla. And Tesla became this thing of all retail traders need to own Tesla because they're going to have a million robo-taxis there by 2020. And it's the most fantastic thing since sliced bread. Now it has gone down, I believe, more than 50% and it keeps dropping. And we're starting to realize here what's going on. Well, liquidity is not what it once was. And that's what you get during these times. Dry up the liquidity, you start to see companies that have some issues. And it could be really bad, or it could be something that might be able to be mitigated, you know, should interest rates decline, you know, in the relatively near future. Yeah, we're seeing the old Warren Buffett quote play out that you find out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. Well, the tide are these interest rate increases from the Fed. When there's a strong dollar, when interest rates are being raised, it's basically a margin call, a global margin call in the global economy, all this dollar denominated debt. And then the lack of easy debt, lack of easy capital for SoftBank out of Japan, which is um, funded a ton of these Silicon Valley tech companies, Chinese tech companies, SoftBank's in a lot of trouble. The guy who started SoftBank has a billions of dollars in debt that he loaned to the company. There's accounting fraud there that may be marked to model. You have Silicon Valley accounting fraud exposed with these interest rate increases and the lack of easy capital. And then you have real estate bus and tech bus in China and uh, in the not too distant future, I suspect we're going to have a real estate bus here in the United States, although I think you're having one in Canada, right? You're up in Toronto. And I think I heard that real estate prices just in the last 12 or so months are down enormously. Yeah, it depends on the area that you're in. And I always try to just say this because people will say, not in my area. Well, it depends on your area. When you look at averages, of course, things are going to look a lot different. But what happened was in many of these different cities, actually, where you go from a place that's the big city, New York, San Francisco, Miami, whatever the case is, you look at the big city, and it was far too expensive for people. And they also wanted to move out of the condos, and they wanted to move into their, you know, more suburban or even rural areas. They did that, they moved out. And what happened? Well, these smaller cities, tertiary cities, or even just kind of out into the suburbs of the main cities, they did not have the capacity to deal with all these people who, by the way, don't really want to own a home. They can't deal with a home. Suddenly, they're moving out into these places and a house that was once $200,000 because now you have 50 people able to buy it, it's $400,000. Well, those people that live in that area, they can't even afford that. So we saw this major like disruption that occurred in real estate. Well, now that's reversing. And a lot of these places, I just saw a few examples 
where it had sold at the peak and then it's already being resold again and it's down literally hundreds of thousands of dollars from where it was before. So let's just give an example, round numbers. It was a million dollars that it sold for at the peak. Now it's selling for 700 and change. Like we're talking about- Is that Toronto? Big differences. Or is, or is yeah, this in-, in, in like outside of Toronto, yes. So you're seeing extreme examples. Now, if you look at the core of Toronto, where you have this very sought after neighborhoods and the, all the homes are, you know, let's say well kept, they're all, um, you know, two million dollar homes there's only so many all the schools are rated you know 9.0 or higher uh, they've got the facilities and the amenities all around these places are going to stay with much higher valuations they're not going to attain the nonsense that was before like put it this way it was so crazy that any home listed would be bought immediately that they couldn't even do uh, like put offers. They would say, no, we're holding off offers until this particular date. You are not allowed to get any conditions whatsoever. You cannot do financial conditions and you cannot do home inspection conditions. You buy the home and you get what you get. And that's how crazy it was. Every single home was doing this. And of course, people get the home. Oops, we got a foundation problem. Suddenly tens of thousands of dollars of, you know, things that they weren't expecting. And that's okay because interest rates were super low. But now we're in a different world. And now it's going to be very painful for these places here. It works a little bit different in um, Canada. Even Australia is like this too, different than the US. In the US, you get a 30-year mortgage, 25-year mortgage, whatever the case may be, and you're getting the interest rate, let's say 4%, for that entire duration. Whereas in Canada or Australia, uh, I believe Australia is the same, where you you basically have to, after a three to five year period, you have to essentially get a new mortgage, okay? um, like as if you're refinancing. And so what's that going to be come the time in which people need to do that? Well, it's going to be a lot higher than what they paid last time, potentially double what they paid oh, just a, a few years ago. Are people going to be able to pay twice the mortgage that they did before that isn't like it's like you're driving over the cliff that's what's happening right now and we know it's coming we're not there yet though we're still on solid ground so it's all good well the u.s hasn't had the bust either yet although sales are slowing down there's just not as many buyers because people can't get credit so uh, people are looking at seven eight even if you have a pristine credit score perfect credit score here in the united states you're looking at seven or eight percent for a mortgage i mean for 30 years so the average person can't afford that it's not a good it's not a good investment um or for their monthly income, especially in a recession or depression. But doesn't Canada, isn't there a lot of home equity loans too? So that's something that's similar to the US housing bubble. There was a lot of Canadians that were pulling equity out doing these home equity loans while real estate prices were rising the last six, seven, eight years up until the last 12 months. Okay, but but here it's like a religious belief uh, that the home never goes down in price. So um, they're not concerned about that. They really aren't. And I'm not trying to joke around like it's crazy like um it, it's the home never goes down like even if it went down 20 percent tomorrow they just ignore it they just put their head in the sand that's it they ignore it i mean this is what happens when you got real estate agents mortgage brokers and everything since 1991 or whatever it was um that when real estate did take a big beating because of the the banking sector in canada was not doing well um after that point prices have never basically never come down. So the, you have people that worked their entire career so far and have never seen a dip. Only so a bull market. Gonna believe that. Yeah, only, only, only a bull, bull market. market. So they've never been in a bear market. It's like these crypto people that okay. just came into crypto the last two, two and a half years. They weren't in past bull or bear market cycles where the crypto price, the price of Bitcoin dropped 70, 80, 90% in a short amount of time. They haven't been through a bear market cycle before. Of course. And now I, I think what people are looking at, they're, they're trying to use all these models for Bitcoin and for everything else. And you're you're doing it on the shortest, like we don't have enough data. Uh, Bitcoin was whatever, 2008, 2009 created. And really it only started to get known uh, probably around 2013 or so. So you have less than a decade of information, you're trying to base the decisions off of that. Like as soon as interest rates started to rise, what happened? 
Bitcoin got smashed. Bitcoin got smashed. Nobody wants to admit that. Like it's it's yeah. so important to link the what the Fed is doing and all other assets. Yeah, I was hearing from a lot of Bitcoin people for the last 12, 18 months that Bitcoin's a safe haven. It's safer than gold. But look, it's highly correlated with the NASDAQ. So I would say it's risk on rather than risk off and a safe haven. Now, if you have, yeah, now if you have Bitcoin and you've taken it off a centralized exchange, so if you were smart enough six, eight, 12 months ago and bought a Trezor or a Ledger and you stored your Bitcoin off an exchange, you don't have to worry about all of this accounting fraud with the FTT tokens that the market's working through. And what we just were recording this interview on Tuesday, December 13th, 2022 at night. And these articles for Wall Street Journal, David, are coming out in the last couple of days. I mean, there's hundreds of millions of dollars that are being pulled out of these cryptocurrency exchanges in a day or two. I think Binance is the newest one. People are, don't trust what these uh, centralized cryptocurrency exchanges are saying about the reserve reports, how much Bitcoin they actually own. Um, it sounds like old school fractional reserve banking with these uh, centralized crypto exchanges and, and accounting fraud, straight up accounting fraud. I like since day one when I got into cryptocurrency, started learning about this and everything. Since day one, the understanding was you do not keep your coins, bitcoins or, or cryptos, whatever it is, you do not keep them on an exchange. Never do that. I've, I've been I've heard that thousands and thousands of times. Yet, because people are so confident or maybe so lazy that they don't want to take the time and the effort to buy a treasure, to buy a ledger, whatever it is, or, you know, use a paper wallet, whatever, and actually take that step and make that happen. It's completely, in my opinion, it's, uh, you know, I'm trying to be nice about it. It is not wise. We'll call it that. It is not wise to do that. And yet we've heard it so many times. And then people say, I'm so mad at Sam Bankman free that like, any bank tomorrow could say, I'm sorry, we have a bank holiday. We're not letting you access your cash. Go to the ATM and you can't take out your money. Doors are closed. You can't get in. You can't get your money. People say, what do you mean? Or a currency yeah. devaluation. I mean, in Argentina, they exactly. had bank they had bank holidays in Argentina where if you had a bank account, you had dollars or euros, a foreign currency that was more valuable than the Argentinian peso. They forced you into the local currency and stole your better currency and then devalued your bank account. 100% and people, they, they keep getting burned but never realizing that it's not FTX that's the problem. It's the way the system is built. Okay, it's just like people need to wake up to that. Like, and when, and unfortunately, they won't. Some people will. Hopefully, the people listening to, listen to this will. But the truth is, most people don't, and they get burned here, they get burned there, and unfortunately, that's the way it goes. Well, the other problem, David, is that the rule of law. So you have these billionaires and these fraudsters, and they're doing money laundering. I mean, FTX was not designed as a stable company at first. It was built as a fraud from listening to hedge fund manager Marco Hodes talk about how the company was built and who was hired. I mean, it was sold as a centralized cryptocurrency exchange, but the whole thing was designed as a accounting fraud and money laundering scheme from the jump. And these uh, billionaire CEOs, they should be charged with tons and tons of accounting fraud. And it, it, look, here we are. He finally just got arrested, I think, in the last 24 hours. But I mean, he should have been in prison a while ago. He was free in the Bahamas for weeks. I have some speculation around this that will never be uncovered. But I do have something to share. So up until this time, he's been doing all these interviews. He's been talking nonstop. Twitter spaces. He's been doing podcasts, everything. He went on CoffeeZilla and CoffeeZilla did this, you know, his pretend investigations that he does. And so the guy's been very open about it. And then they say, um, you know what? He said, whatever the government wants me to do, I'm going to do it. And so they said, okay, we're going to have him speak. He's going to have to testify. All right. I'm going to testify. Then one day prior, literally just hours prior, I read the CNBC article that said he's refusing to testify. Weird. He just said a moment ago he was going to testify. Okay. Who testifies? Who comes there? It's the new CEO. This new CEO, as far as I'm aware, 
FTX Group's CEO, John J. Ray. And if I'm not mistaken, that's, that was the guy who you know, did the, the one for Enron. That guy came in. Okay, let me, like, let's go back one minute here. Think about the, the situation. November 6, November 7, November 8, these are like bad days for FTX. First, he's tweeting out, everybody's got their money, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. A few hours later, he deletes the tweet, and then you know everything was messed up after that. Within like literally like 48 hours, he claimed bankruptcy. Who, what kind of company claims files for bankruptcy literally a couple days after acknowledging the problem? That is that is unheard of. And then once he claimed filed for bankruptcy, he has no access to what happened at the company. So he hasn't figured out what the problem is. He's already filed for bankruptcy. This new guy comes over. He's the CEO. Now SBF, he doesn't have access. He's gone. I'm no longer the CEO. I stepped down. New guy comes in. He's saying there's a whole bunch of fraud. He's saying that uh, there's no book. They were using QuickBooks for their accounting. They have nothing. Oh, what's going on here? I have no information. He's saying, I got nothing. I got nothing going on here. We, it's all fraud. It's all fraud. Then he's testifying in front of Congress saying the same thing. It's all fraud. I think something else. I'm not saying that SBF is a good guy. Please don't, please don't, don't get me wrong. I don't know what's going on. I think something is very suspicious about the whole way that it went down. And it's not normal. This isn't one guy was doing a bunch of fraud, got caught. Suddenly he just says, okay, I'm going to, you know, just shut the company down. To me, something else is going on. I don't have any more facts other than that. But the timeline and the way that it unfolded is extremely suspicious. Well, I believe they had almost zero Bitcoins in custody and they were doing some type of fractional reserve scheme. So they were they were lending it out. They had what this trading arm that was labeled at Alameda Research. It wasn't a research company at all. It was a bad crypto hedge fund that was using all the customer accounts at FTX as collateral for loans. So, I mean, the whole thing was just a, it was a mess and a fraud. We, I mean, yes, <laughs> there's clearly like, you know, you see these things that come out and how many times have we seen one, it doesn't have to be a crypto company, any company. This is the next thing since sliced bread. This is, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. They're doing everything right. They got advertisements here. They got celebrity Kim Kardashian is, uh, you know, all over this. And then what happens? We find out things weren't the way that they said it was. It's all when marketing it's too hype. good to be true. Yeah. When it's all, when it's too good to be true, likely it is. Okay. So that, this is like, goes back to having absolute fundamentals in in the way that you invest if people put all their money into tesla tesla went up like a rocket and everybody felt so i saw these videos from from these i won't even mention names but other youtubers or whatever saying going all in on tesla now you rolled that up you did extremely well but did you sell no because you thought that it would 10 10 x from there so you didn't sell and yeah, now you're gambling. minus six yeah, you're minus sixty percent. Like, yeah, you're a gambler. Like you're is... not. You're not an investor. You're not diversifying. You're putting. You're That's going right. like when I hear the phrase "all in on this" or "all in on that," it just worries me. Me because that person has a gambler mentality. They don't have an investor mentality. They're not thinking about risk versus reward. They're only seeing the upside. So they, like you said, they they saw that they could get a high return on their Tesla stock, but past performance doesn't guarantee future performance. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you look at it and you just have to say, are, you know, I always judge it on, based on that person and think, look, if you got $500 or something, okay, you know, you can just let it ride. Hopefully it'll 10x or something, right? Because it's not a big sum. But if you've got something a little bit more substantial, you don't want to do it all in one place. You want to start building a foundation. You want to have that diversification and you want to have real assets because they're going to weather the storm. They're going to weather the storm beyond your life, hopefully. And that's really important. And it's, it's missed because today everybody wants the easiest thing. I could just go into my Robinhood app. I could click two buttons and I could buy the next 
latest and greatest thing. Why do I need to, you know, buy real estate? Why do I need to buy precious metals? I gotta, I gotta keep the precious. Why do I keep those precious metals? That's so difficult. Like this, this is the way that people think. And then you know, you realize what are the very wealthiest people doing? Are they going out there and buying Apple stock? Warren Buffett doesn't buy Apple stock. Berkshire Hathaway buys buys Apple stock, but he's in a different position than most people too. And what does Warren Buffett say? He says, "When I die." Take the, take my money and put it into the S and P five hundred index because for most people they can't beat it. It's just over the long, over decades and decades, they can't even beat the market. Yeah, I think human nature goes against a lot of successful investors because people either they're up a lot on a stock or they view past performance and then they chase future performance based on past performance. They don't understand diversification. If they have a lot of gains in one stock, they don't think about taking money off the table and reallocating their portfolio. I actually had a great uncle before he passed away. He actually lost around $400,000 in Bear Stern stock because he had owned it for decades and made it enormous returns off of it. And he wasn't thinking about a 2008 financial crisis. He passed away a couple of years after the 2008 financial crisis. And I had sat down with him and he was like all upset that he had lost so much money on the Bear Stern stock. And I was just discussing with him that why, while it was going up, things were going good. Why weren't you taking some money off the table and diversifying and putting it into other asset classes that were cheap and hated and just reallocating your portfolio that way? And he was just saying, well, I didn't think I needed to do that because it was still going up and I was collecting all these dividends and I didn't think they would leverage their balance sheet, what, 60 to 1? So, and <laughs> and his the funny thing is his son actually is a... um. One of my relatives is actually like a, a former hedge fund manager that worked for one of the big shots. So even though he worked on Wall Street, like he wasn't getting good advice even from his own son. <laughs> That's the way it is. You know, you look at what people say. It's like, you know, I'm just going to hold this stock for six months and then it crashes by 50 percent. They say, you know what? This is a long term hold. Suddenly, they just become. You go from a trader to an investor. It's a long term hold now, and that's that's like the mentality that people have because they really don't know what to do. That they're they're just buying it based on okay, you know, I heard it on the news or somebody else was into it or you know, I saw Elon Musk tweet about it or something. And it's like, you know, you're talking about in many cases, this is like this will affect your livelihood. So it's not something to screw around with. And um, unfortunately, today they've made it so easy because of like Robinhood and all these other things. And in the case of FTX, you can jump, you can throw a big chunk of money in there, and it can evaporate tomorrow. Oh yeah. So there, there was a ton know. of people trading on their smartphones who are making tens of thousands of dollars or six figures in 12, 18 months trading crypto, altcoins, uh, stock options, just trading on their phones. Or a quick laptop trade here. There, we're seeing all these videos on social media, on TikTok, Instagram, um, all these other uh, social media platforms. How easy it was to get rich quick, but a lot of those people were not hedged, were not diversified, and now they're in a lot of trouble. Yeah, some people. I'm sure there were some people that made it out and and really got lucky on that. Like I see some people driving a Lamborghini, and you know, you look at the guy and think, I feel like this guy just. He just got rich and you know that maybe he sold at the peak or near the peak and he made it on those are you know few and far between and i hope that people find success in that but for the average person it, it just makes sense to have diversification you hear this type of thing all the time and you know don't diversify because you know that's always a losing game you know that that quote that comes from actually both buffett and munger roughly paraphrasing um it's you gotta understand what that means. Like, if you look at what Buffett's into, he's not going to diversify out and, for instance, start selling on Amazon. He's not going to do that because that would be bad diversification for her, for him. It doesn't make sense. He knows what he's doing, but he has a way of doing it that can make him money. He knows the ins and outs. But for most people, you got to understand, you, what, are you, what are you doing? You're in a nine-to-five job. Okay, if you're in a nine-to-five job, what are you doing on the side to make sure that you can multiply the money that you're bringing in? And for a lot of people, they simply just you know, take it to their employer. They say, hey, the employer is going to match 
They're going to put into my 401k. And then eventually when I'm 65, I'll be able to pull that money out. And everything is A-OK. That's the retirement plan that you have. This is likely not going to work. Okay, because it doesn't mean that from you know how old you are today until the time you need to retire, that thing's going to be very linear. It might be very chaotic, and you may not be able to retire at sixty-five, and then all your plans are changed. So the way that you build your investments has to be built around the understanding that the traditional way is not like pretend that if you're, well, even if you you are dumping your money in there, that might not be the right way. I, in my opinion, everybody that's capable should have their own business. It's very important because you have control. Well, I think we're going through from a financial history perspective, something that's similar to a uh, post-World War environment, post-major war with all these different governments, because it's looking like we're going to have currency crises and government bond crises in a lot of different countries now, whether it's Japan, the European Union, the United Kingdom, and eventually the U.S., with how much debt, the national debt, and with, at these higher interest rates, I mean, the U.S. federal government, the U.S. Treasury, we're looking at next year, David, in 2023, $1 trillion per year just in interest payments on a rapidly growing national debt. That is a large chunk of the annual federal tax receipts. So that's not sustainable. Now, the U.S. may be safe for last compared to these other countries, but we are seeing examples of these other countries hitting the wall. Looks like Japan has finally hit the wall. I think they sold $81 billion worth of their U.S. treasuries in a single month because they needed the cash. That's a big problem, but their understanding is simply don't worry about it. If you look at stock market right now, it does not care. Like it's it's completely ignoring um and by the way, Apple carrying the entire market. But um, if you look at it, it basically does not care that we're in this position because as soon as there's a problem, the Federal Reserve is just going to print more money and they're going to reduce interest rates and they're going to save the day. That's the understanding. They've mentioned over and over again, and probably by the time this interview goes live, that you know they're going to say it again, we are committed to bringing the inflation down after their 50 basis point rate hike, after the terminal rate hits 5%, which it has not done in a very long time, they're just going to reiterate it and the market's just going to ignore it again because that's just the way it goes. So I'm, you know, the, the chaos is right in front of us right now. We're dealing with so many different issues, but as long as we, you know, the stock market is a forward looking mechanism. Well, it's going to be uh, very interesting to see anyway, because you're seeing a lot of these companies, I mentioned again, Tesla, that were so fantastic. We ha- we should include them in the FANG stocks. Like everybody would talk about that. It's a, fa- it's a part of the FANG stock suddenly, and now it's hated. Well, you know, this is the way it goes. But um, interest rates are really, in my opinion, the, the, like the most important thing. The, the, the amount of money on the balance sheet, Federal Reserve, their actions each and every step of the way. I watch all of them. I watch every time there's a uh, a meeting, a conference, uh, an interview. I get all that information. They all say the exact same thing. And by the way, the same thing for the other, other central banks too. They all are on the same page. And I don't know how they're going to get out of the debt crisis when uh, they're claiming that they want to keep inflation down. Of course, I believe that they will not keep inflation down and they will allow a much higher level of inflation to take place, which means you, the individual out there holding out the cash, will eventually be burned. They want to punish people for holding cash. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, historically, the way governments, especially large governments, get out of debt problems as they inflate the debt away. So Japan, for the last 30 or so years, they kind of bucked the historical trend. They didn't have a currency crisis. They were able to keep buying government bonds without problems with their currency. But historically, governments either they have uh, they can only defend their currency or their government bond market. They can't do both. It seems Japan has finally hit the wall. But I suspect these governments will, will want to uh, inflate the debt away. I don't think they're going to... Um, technically default on their debt where there's a big default 
But you brought up an interesting point here about the stock market going up. I think what a lot of people who are new to this and haven't been paying attention to markets, what they don't understand is that the stock market could go up in nominal value while your wealth, your purchasing power is being inflated away via currency devaluation. And then you're also being taxed on capital gains on stocks, bonds, real estate, all these things. And then the government's taking more via currency devaluation and then taxing nominal gains on the stock market. So like in the past with some of these uh, hyperinflations or large amounts of inflation in a Zimbabwe or a Venezuela or or in Argentina, you had the stock markets go up in nominal value. So you had large stock market increases, but they did not keep pace with the currency devaluation and the inflation rate. So if you own stocks in those countries, your net worth actually decreased, your purchasing power actually decreased while the stocks were rising in nominal value, you actually became poorer. 100%. Even if we don't see to the point of a hyperinflation, like think about the prospect of, they're not going to give us the real rate of inflation, but let's just say it runs at a 5% per year. And that's just normal now. Now it's 5% per year. So we went from what they claim to be, let's say two or 3%. Now it's more than double that. So the real rate of inflation obviously be much higher. And if you look at it, the average person is just going to get burned year after year. No longer is 65 okay for retirement. It's 70. No longer are you able to live as one person inside of a house. You got to live two, three, four, five people that maybe, you know, uh, suddenly you're living with a different family member. Suddenly you're, you know, cohabit, cohabiting or whatever it's called with the, you know, six different people as a young people. These are the things that have to happen because you can't keep up with the inflation and we're unwilling to address the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is the fact that they keep printing this darn money and they keep devaluing the currency. And there's ways to, you know, like I said, look, what are the what are the richest of the rich people buying? What do they buy? They buy real assets. They buy art. They buy fine wine. They buy high end luxury uh, goods like watches and all these. You know, women will buy their purses and all these things that are ten thousand dollars. And they buy real estate. They buy precious metals, uh, gems, diamonds, all these things. And of course, I hear the argument all the time. Art is for money laundering. People don't understand what's going on here. These people understand, the, the, the richest of the rich people understand that once they have everything, they've got two mansions, they've got the Rolls Royce, they've got everything else, they're not going to keep their money in the bank. They're not going to keep their money in a mutual fund. They're going to go buy a piece of art that costs $30 million dollars. Because they realize that that piece of art is always going to go up in value. It's like a bank account, except they get to enjoy it on their wall. Just like they're going to buy a Patek Philippe watch that costs $40,000 because they know next year it's going to be $42,000 and then $45,000. It's not about money laundering. It's not about hating these groups. It's that we've got to learn and understand where is it that we need to place our value? We traded our, our time by working the nine to five job or our business, and we need to exchange that for something that's going to keep up with this massive devaluation of currency that's taking place every single day. And they've committed to doing more of that. So we can sit here and say, is it right or wrong? Or we could just simply say, what do I got to do? And we'll look at what these guys are doing, and you see. This is the way it goes. Well, a lot of those very rich people, before they started buying art and the the finer things in life, the fancier stuff, mansions, artwork, uh, collectible cars, uh, antiques, things like that, they own their own business. So they, there was a family business that, that generated the wealth, that had growth, that threw off cash flow, that provided uh, the consumer with a new product or service. So that's how the wealth was built. Now, once it the business was established and it had a good product or service, then you could go and buy all those nice things afterwards. That's exactly right. That's why I said you you everybody should figure out how to create their own business because then you maintain the control. If, for instance, you don't want to pay taxes this year, well, you can create different ways to have a lot of expenses because you can kind of push your earnings off into next year. And then next year, you can figure out what to do. And you decide that you have much more control. These things are not, are not possible if you're working a nine-to-five job. But when you have that business, suddenly you can do so many more things. 
and actually um, you know, have many of the advantages that a lot of the big guys do. But until we get out of this paradigm of, you know, the way that we live our lives and most people, um, we're not going to be able to take advantage. But in terms of investments, though, do you think that we've gone to a sentiment wise where commodities are hated? I mean, I'm looking at some of the stats here for hedge funds and shorts. I mean, we're at high record levels of short positions now on oil futures contracts. Sentiment was very low for gold for a long time. Do you think that we're going to see new bull markets for gold and other commodities in the not too distant future? It's hard to assume, um, you know, what would happen exactly. The way I look at it is, for me, I never look at the price of precious metals ever. I think that um, we should all have some level of of real assets, precious metals, silver, gold. People ask, what's the right ratio of silver to gold? Okay, silver has the higher potential, this and that. Um, I think 50-50 between that. But again, you know, even some people who are, super bullish on precious metals a lot of them only advise let's say 10 percent during normal times 10 percent of your entire total portfolio to be in precious metals why because you don't make cash flow from the precious metals um that's one of the disadvantages that it has but what's the advantage is that you can literally take that and you can pass it on generation to generation to generation it always maintains value always it will always maintain value it will always have that and there's going to be times in which price goes down but that has nothing to do with its value that's paper that's all paper stuff so you know in where could we see it obviously if you look at what happens with inflation if they allow inflation to go up much higher then precious metals look more attractive but they, they're always playing the numbers and we're never going to be able to predict it as far as i'm aware i think just just having some of that as part of your portfolio is fantastic. If you're not into that, I, that's kind of why I mentioned like watches and stuff. Because if you can buy a instead of spending ten thousand dollars on, uh, you know, some precious metals, what if you bought ten thousand dollar nice watch like a Rolex or something? Because that Rolex will be more expensive next year. It's going to be more expensive the year after. It's in limited quantity, and you can buy. Uh, Rolex watches are more than 10 grand, but that are actually precious metals if you wanted to do that. The point is you're getting something of value to offset the devaluation of the currency. That's just the way I look at it. I just kind of simplify. Okay, why why would I buy a precious metal? And it's because I don't trust the system of the dollar. That's really what I'm doing here. It's a bet against the dollar. It's not has nothing to really to do fundamentally with the precious metal because I won't use that precious metal. You're going to keep it somewhere safe. So well, that's, the, it's not about the precious metal. Well, the physical gold and silver also has less uh, counterparty risk. And in an environment where central banks have raised interest rates and we haven't had all the effects of that, we haven't had big real estate buffs across the board yet, especially here in the United States, although commercial real estate, we're seeing a lot of signs of that. But as more and more sect companies and companies in different sectors start to feel the effects of a recession or depression of higher interest rates, they can't get funding. So they their sales are down, revenue down at the business because of a recession or depression. The consumer's not spending, they're tapped out, they're um, putting things on credit card, they're, they've emptied their savings. And then on top of that, the business has to deal with much higher interest rates. You're going to start to see a lot more bankruptcies in a lot of from a lot of different companies and sectors, similar to what happened after the October 1929 crash here in the US and the 1970 stagflation with the interest rates going up plus inflation. So Volcker raising the interest rates that caused a lot of businesses going bankrupt. And all that counterparty risk, David, that seems to be restoring things in the last month or so for gold and silver as a safe haven status, where if you own the metal, you don't have to worry about a company in a different sector dealing with interest rate risk, bankruptcy risk, their consumer sales collapsing in, in a recession or depression, depending upon how long this is prolonged by how central banks, if they want to keep raising interest rates. Absolutely. that's I, I do agree with you. That's why... I, I believe that precious metals should be a part of everybody's portfolio. There's no question. You, you, you know, you have to keep your wealth basically in your hands or as close to it as possible. And there's always going to be these different crises along the way. And if we're not actually protecting ourselves, well, then we're going to be in big trouble at some point. That point could be 
tomorrow. That point could be in 20 years. And but let me tell you, it hurts a lot harder, <laughs> hurts a lot more if you've been growing something for 20 years and then you get smacked down. You would rather happen when it's worth a lot less. So, I mean, there's no question. Um, it It is the ultimate safe haven. I just caution against people having, you know, they say I'm a hundred percent in precious metals because yeah. you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. Um, rules changes. But, yeah. I mean, these governments could literally tax, they could change the tax rules on all these different asset classes. So we could see that happen. Anything is, <laughs> I would not put, put past you know, anything on these, on these people. Um, but, but of course it is wise to hold precious metals like I said, don't be focused on the the ratios and all these things. Um, I just believe in diversity, even within the precious metals asset classes. You look at silver; there are many different types. You can get coins, you can get bars. Small denominations are always preferable. That's the way I look at it, and even geographical diversification too. These are important things. Um, oh and yeah, I totally it just shows agree. us. Yeah, it just shows us that we can enter into a crisis, and nobody let's say nobody cares about precious metals and suddenly things get really messy and all of a sudden they're in high demand. It's always the case. Uh, you know what? Uh, precious metals, no thank you, no thank you. And then suddenly, oh, the, the banking system's collapsing in 2008, uh, 2007. And then, you know, suddenly it, it was like really hot. Then it sold off. Then it surged back. It's, it's, it's the same kind of thing that can happen over and over again. Um, and I just want to tell people to really look long and hard at where your money is. I think it's really underrated. Yeah. We're starting to get a lot of red flags about bank stocks the last couple of weeks. I mean, a lot of bank stocks are down 10, 15, 20% in short order. Credit Suisse was barely above $3 a share. I mean, if that stock stays too low, they're going to have pension funds and mutual funds are going to be required by their bylaws to sell the share. So they're going to have to do something quick in the next couple weeks to figure out how to get the stock price back up above $5 a share, or there's going to be even more selling. It's going to cascade and create a vicious cycle in Credit Suisse stock. So we'll see what, what happens with that. But you brought up an important point about going all in on any one asset class or any one stock. And that always worries me when I see people say that I'm all in on Tesla stock, or I'm all in on Bitcoin, or I'm all in on, on real estate, or I'm on in on gold and silver. And then you have a scenario where look at all the centralized cryptocurrencies exchanges and people are like, oh, it was just FTX. Uh, we're far from over. I mean, the stuff I'm seeing with the hedge fund managers and experienced short sellers posting things all over Twitter, detailed analysis of accounting fraud, going through all the bankruptcies. I mean, we haven't, they haven't, um, it looks like Binance is the newest one, but all these cryptocurrency exchanges, the banks like Silvergate that lent to the cryptocurrency exchanges, Tether, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, there's red flags, David, throughout the sector. Now, if you bought Bitcoin and you took it off an exchange, okay, but it just worries me when I hear these people say all in on gold or silver, all in on real estate or all in on Bitcoin, because then you don't have any type of insurance policy or diversification plan in case there's accounting fraud. It's so important to like to really address why are you investing in this thing? Is it because you really believe in it? People believe in Bitcoin. The people who who say I really believe in Bitcoin, um, I understand, but it doesn't mean that all of your wealth should be in Bitcoin. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. You want to yeah. have something, you, like I, I. You read the original Satoshi Nakamoto white paper. I mean, it's beautiful. Just read the first paragraph. That's that's fantastic. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of your wealth should be in there. And like I said, if you only have five hundred bucks, okay, sure. You you want to just hope that it multiplies. I get it. Fine. But if you're the type of person who could have been buying a piece of real estate with that and could have been holding on to some other assets with that and mixing it around a bit, you know, I just I just don't see it as being a wise thing to do. I just I just can't I just <laughs> you know, it's just not well, the way I, I see I, things. Well, what I would say, David, is that a lot of people who bought Bitcoin and altcoins and were um speculating on these NFTs, non-fungible tokens, artwork, things like that. 
the last 18 months, they were not buying Bitcoin and crypto because they read the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper. They were buying it because the price was going up and they were greedy. Oh, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah, this this board ape is going to be worth $10 million by tomorrow because Justin Bieber tweeted it or something. Then, uh, you know. Oh, there, there was just higher and higher price targets on Bitcoin. There was this one troll who was harassing me, and he's saying that that gold's going below 1400 even though the miners can't produce most of their gold at that price, and silver's going to $10. And then I looked up his post history, and it, he's predicting, he was predicting that Bitcoin would hit over $100,000 by the end of this year. This was like six months ago that he was making these predictions. So he's lying about his prediction. So it's just uh, obviously he was in these things for the wrong reason, making higher and higher price targets and then lying about their track record. But there's lots of people that do things like this, that buy things for the wrong reason. They buy something because it's going up and then they put too much money into it or they have a lot of gains. They don't want to pay taxes or they don't think about it and they don't pull any money off the table. Yeah, it's so risky. It's so dangerous. I mean, people only learn the hard way. And and the unfortunate part is if they end up losing, then they want to double down. And that's really sad to see. And, and you get into these people. Um, I see, you know, I'm thinking of one YouTuber, uh, big kind of popular channel out there who's just a really degenerate gambler. And his followers, you read the comments, and I've done this before. I want to see what kind of the sentiment is out there. And they're all all with him. All with them. Hey, I'm going all in on Tesla. It's like, okay. I mean, you you should shouldn't be like this. And this is not an actual investor. And being a degenerate gambler is a really bad thing, especially if you have a family. And uh, that's not really not wise. I mean, I don't know how to say it any any other way. Um, you just gotta really read more and understand more and look at it like, why am I investing? Like, if you're not really understanding, is, is maximum appreciation the only reason to invest if that's the case i mean to me that's unusual um and it shows a very like a small mentality like if you're just like i need to make the most amount of money then that in my opinion you should be investing in uh, e-commerce business it's like if that was like if you really wanted that you should be in an e-commerce business because you can start with a small sum and build it up into a large one or even a service-based business but well, if you're trying to make the maximum amount of money and you're investing in stock, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Also, like anyone who's going all in on Tesla, yeah, for a certain amount of years, the stock was going up a lot. But you're not, if you're going all in on Tesla, you probably can't read financial statements. I mean, I've had discussions with Tesla longs and I'm friends with a lot of hedge fund managers that were short Tesla stock at the wrong time and they were caught in short squeezes. But I mean, they would just lay out the case. For all the financial problems at Tesla, the accounting fraud, all the other shenanigans that he played with the stock. And that's probably one of the major reasons why he bought Twitter recently was because there are a lot of red flags and problems with Tesla's operational business. I mean, the more they tried to grow their electric vehicle sales, the the larger the losses were. Plus, like all these other businesses, they said they were going to do like insurance, robo taxis. None of them have come to fruition. And there's tons of competition for uh, their electric vehicle battery sales and all these other things that he said were going to be immensely profitable. None, none of them have come to fruition, though. But basically, like if you can read financial statements, David, I know I know you can. But for the listeners out there, if you can't read the financial statements, why are you buying individual stocks unless you're um, paying for very expensive research and newsletters that are going to go through these things? Because that's how you prevent yourself from losing a lot of money. In an, in an individual company, like my great uncle, who I talked about earlier, I mean, if he could read financial statements, he was a dentist, even though his son was a big shot hedge fund manager, he personally couldn't read a lot of financial statements. So he didn't understand all the risks with Bear Stearns while he had hundreds of thousands of dollars in capital gains in the stock. So he didn't understand he needed to take money off the table. He didn't see that Bear Stearns was making these uh, mortgage-backed securities and other derivative stuff. And they had their silver short position and their balance sheet had gotten leveraged to 60 times, 60 times leverage, just insane. So he didn't understand all the risks when he was owning so much of his net worth in that individual stock. For most people, and I'm not giving financial advice here, but if it was a friend of mine that was asking which stock should I buy, I want to buy stocks, and they were convinced on stocks. In my opinion, just holding the index is is the best way. 
because you're trying to pick these stocks and it's just not going to work out for most people over a long period of time. Like if you look at Tesla, sure, I can take a little snapshot and I could say, look, it's increased a thousand percent during this period, but you got to understand where you bought. And did you buy it only one time and then you just let it ride the entire time? Or did you buy it on 27 different occasions and you have all these different price points? Um, like just buying the index, I think is just for most people, well, there's a much more wise e- decision. There's ETFs now, David. So you can buy a basket of companies and industries. Right. So you don't have to have individual company risk. So if you want to own, say, gold stock, if if you think oil and natural gas companies are cheap now because they're down 30 or 40 percent, you don't have to buy an individual company anymore. You can there's a bunch of different oil and natural gas producer ETFs that you can buy a basket of these things so you can get exposure. So that's um a, a welcome addition for investors and traders now are these basket ETFs for se- for sectors. I completely agree. It's just like you, you've got people that their entire job is just to look at the financial data all day long and their general returns over a long period of time are negative. Like the, the only reason they make money, they've made money because of the fees that they charge their clients usually, but usually the, the performance of a lot of these businesses are terrible and they end up going out of business. People always say the hedge funds are bad and there's a, the, the hedge funds usually go out of business. That's just the way it works. So, you know, I look at it like, you know, you, you're not going generally, you're not going to be better than most of these people who spend all their life doing it, studied it in school, and then literally spent an entire career in it. So why why fight against that? Like why are why are people trying to do that? It's it's just well, wild. Well, most of the financial industry, David, are just salespeople. So these hedge fund guys, a lot of these guys are just sales and marketing guys, and a lot of their trades are copied from other people. So they're not generating alpha. They're piling onto their trend traders or they're piling, they're speaking with their friends and buddies. And they're talking about how to manipulate a market, as we've seen with fines with from different hedge fund managers and others over the years. They're paying for inside information. They're colluding with other hedge fund managers how to manipulate a market, or they're just straight up copying a trade of another big shot hedge fund manager and trying to ride on the coattails of that other guy. There are very few money managers, hedge fund managers that are actually really good at stock picking and can generate alpha anymore. It's mostly sales, marketing, and raising capital, and then collecting fees, like you said. That's the way it goes. But again, people will never learn. They're going to say, Warren Buffett bought Apple, I'm buying Apple. And that's, that's, that's the end of that. You can't convince them otherwise. And they'll say, look how many, look, everyone's got an iPhone. Therefore, Apple's a good buy. Like, it's just not even for most people. It's just, it's, there's like no semblance of reality. There's no application of any sort of due diligence taking place. And it's just all, it's all about an echo chamber. If I go to Reddit, terrible websites, Reddit, or I go to one of these other places that all these retail traders like to go, they're all just going to, make each other feel good about their purchases. Look at GameStop. Look at AMC. Look at the direction of these stocks and where they've headed. Are these really quality companies? Or was it that everybody was on the same train? Let's all let's all psych each other up. This is going to be great. We're going to win. We're going to beat the hedge funds. We're going to do this. Are these really solid? Like, is that where you want to put a lot of your money? Sure, you could have a rent, you can have buckets. And you have a whole portfolio, let's say 100%, and you put 5 or 10% into risky. That's fine. You want to do that. And that, by the way, doesn't mean 5 or 10% in, let's say, GME or AMC or whatever you, th- you think is considered risky. I'm talking about spreading that with 5, 10, 20 different things. So you're putting, so you, you lose it all. Okay, no, no, no problem. 1% down. It, that's the way people need to think about it. You need to have a lot more security and you can take risk, but with a smaller percentage of your total portfolio. And then also like with the GameStop and the AMC, I mean, the AMC management after the um, Wall Street bets, people came in, they raised a bunch of capital. I mean, the management team that was there, they abused the capital that was raised. They, they started buying what a gold mine this is a movie theater chain and they're not <laughs> investing in their movie theater business and they're buying a gold mine. They're buying I- investments into a gold miner with the, uh, a really low grade, high cost gold mine in Nevada that's had problems for 30 or 40 years. There were just so many red flags 
there with the management team and capital allocation. And it just looks like another scam where retail investors got screwed over. Of course, because like, when are people going to wake up that these multi-billion dollar businesses, they, they don't lose. They're not going to lose. You're going to lose. And if you try to play this game of you know nonsense, look, there's, they, they literally go, they, they get, you know, Robin Hood, you see what they've done. They, what's it called? Um, sell to flow or whatever, where they, where they can actually they sold sell the data. data. Yeah. So, That's so right. you weren't they, paying, they come you, in front of you and buy you it. You weren't off. paying they, commissions. They yeah. So you weren't paying commissions for your stock trades. So then you're the product, your information, your data, your trades, they're selling the order flow to these high frequency trading algorithm companies, uh, hedge funds like Citadel and the other big shops in Chicago and New York city. And the, and the point is, you're not going to win against them. You, you can't play that game, or I'm just going to hold my shares, and I'm going to make sure that I'm standing tough. Well, slowly but surely, you're going to get worked down because you need that money, and they don't need to deal with the same thing that you do. Everything is going to be a different circumstance. It's just the way it goes. Okay, That's why we have to be smart about the way we invest, where we put our money, and we have to think multi-decade. If you're not thinking multi-decade where you put your money, it doesn't mean that I'm going to invest in Tesla, or I just use the example of Tesla, but I'm, I'm going to invest in this particular company, and I'm a multi-decade investor. I'm going to hold that for 30 years. So it's okay if it's down by 50% now. But we don't even know if Tesla is going to be here tomorrow. We really don't. And the truth is, where it has been before doesn't mean it can ever even attain that same level ever again. Whatever stock that is, just because it got there does not mean we can get to that price. That's just simply a, a matter of fact. How many companies have we seen that? Look at Japanese housing market, stock market. I mean, that's an extreme example, certainly. Well, but you have, you during have Kodak, that time, you have companies that were the leaders. So a Kodak that's right. film and camera, a blockbuster video, and those businesses really don't exist anymore. They went through bankruptcy and they've been restructured. So those were the market leaders where if you would have said 30 years ago that Kodak was going to go out of business, people weren't going to have their film developed, people were going to have digital cameras in their smartphones and upload everything online, you would have been laughed at. The management team at Kodak would have laughed at you decades ago. And then here they are now, they're dinosaurs. That's just how capitalism works, though, that just because you're on top doesn't mean you're going to stay on top. 100%. And, and like, I mean, I see it really being part of this echo chamber and people just want to be able comfortable about where they're putting their money and we should be much more uncomfortable we should look at things and see risk wherever it is and then decide to put our money here or there but always acknowledging the fact that this is a risk and the fact that i could potentially lose my money when you're going to put it in crypto stocks anything they can always go out of business when you talk about real assets, of course, it works a little differently. If I put my money into gold today, and let's just say it's 1800 that gold could go down. Let's just say it could be $400 tomorrow in paper terms, but I'm not going to sell it. So it's okay. Yeah, the same thing I, I suspect you might buy estate. more if it went to 400 <laughs> yeah, Well, if, if right, it was available, <laughs> the premiums exactly. might be like $1,000 an ounce. <laughs> you would never even be able to get it. And, and the same thing with real estate. If, you're, if your property that you own that's got cash flow positive property, you, you paid, let's just say, make up a number $100,000 for that property and you're cash flowing, I don't know, let's just say $500 a month, you're still getting paid even if that property went from $100,000 down to $50,000, you still get paid. And that's the whole different thing that people don't realize. You, you need cash flow, you need security, you need to own assets, and you need to have diversity in many different ways. But if you're simply just following the herd, you're never going to get there. It's just that's just the way it works. Actually those cash flow with the debt being either paid off on the balance sheet or or inflated away. A lot of that's happening right now with the oil and natural gas companies. So even though the shares are down 30, 40%, I mean, these businesses are still throwing off a lot of cash flow. And you brought up Warren Buffett. I mean, Warren Buffett might be selling some of his overpriced stocks, like, and he's worried about his bank stocks. He's reduced it, he reduced his bank stock positions a lot over the last 12 months, like Wells Fargo and others. 
but he's been buying a lot of oil and natural gas companies because he sees that there's long-term supply problems and there's still a global food and energy crisis. So he's buying things he thinks are cheap that have cash flow and improving balance sheet. And then looking at like global macro trends where electricity demand is going to continue to grow and nat natural gas is basically the, um, I would say the compromise solution for fuel for electricity. And also for the fertilizer too, I think maybe that was part of it when he was thinking about it because you need that natural gas. And you see the complications that we've had with with Russia and so on, and they're just really scrambling to find supplies and things. So um, that's part of it too. Energy is something that if the economy decides to continue to grow, we need more energy. We don't need less energy. It depends on you know, what type of energy, but we're not going away from natural gas and we're clearly not even going away from coal. So these things are all going to be you know, useful. And that means, hey, if that company's producing it and able to you know, put it out there and export it and uh, manufacture, refine it, whatever it might be, well, then these are companies that are considered to be good, potentially good. That's the way we have to look at it, not what's hot. It's not yeah, about I, what's hot. Yeah, I agree. And so much capital has been malinvested the last 10, 15, 20 years in these ESG investments for biofuels, where a lot of land was wasted instead of growing food or crops that were edible, arable land. Instead, it was used for biofuels and in wind and solar. I mean, these things in a lot of areas are very uneconomic. They don't work without government subsidies. So we're going to need investments in nuclear power, natural gas, maybe next generation nuclear power. Those are things that are going to be required going forward. Not, I'm not a big fan of ESG until I see like far better returns on that. I mean, considering what's happened in with solar in Germany and so many firms going <laughs> bankrupt. I mean, there's just countless examples of hundreds of billions of dollars wasted, hundreds of billions of dollars wasted for ESG investments. It's pure garbage right now. I mean, you you would like it. You would like some sort of. Um, it, it's a ripoff scam. It's yeah, it's it's it not is. it's not just pure garbage. David, it's a straight up scam. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's a energy spending grift. Doesn't it? <laughs> I think that's the new um that's the new thing I'm going to go with the the funny name. Nice. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, but people. I mean, it's not a lot of these companies say that they make these rules and they go, you know, they sit in there in conference rooms and boardrooms and they say, we're going to put so much money per year into ESG and we're going to do our part to save the environment. And that's, that's why they do these things. It's so that they can go and they could, you know, virtue signal or whatever and try yeah, to but, but sound so good and all these things. It has nothing to do with, actually saving the environment all these other it it doesn't work it doesn't work in reality ask the manufacturers in germany japan china if they can make a profit manufacture without cheap electricity <laughs> or cheap natural gas of course. i've seen the videos before of the they're charging the solar car so so uh, excuse me they're they're charging an electric car and the reporter or whoever it was asks, excuse me, I'm sorry, what, what is actually charging this charger? Like, where does it get the energy from? And she, the lady says, I think it's coal. I think it's coal. So you're, you're using coal to charge your electric car in that. Just, well, that's, that's just actually blows my mind. That's actually a correct answer. So coal or natural gas. So I'm surprised they could actually answer that. I mean, I've heard some of these people driving hybrids or electric vehicles and you ask them where the energy comes from comes from they say i don't care it's out of the outlet whatever the politician says in my political <laughs> party that's what i'm going with so they don't care yeah. where the electricity comes from they say it's coming out of the outlet <laughs> yeah, exactly i mean i i hope that we'll get there one day and i hope that we can do a lot more in this regard and it would be nice if there are solutions to these things but i think we're much further out from where they pretend that we are today i mean that's just just the way it goes it's i, I think a lot of it's really blocked mess. i think a lot of it's blocked um there's some viable next generation nuclear power like the liquid fluoride molten salt thorium reactor but if you speak to people in the u.s department department of energy i mean they i've heard people that work there tell me that they intentionally blocked any investment or pilot plants from the energy utility companies here in the United States. And these are companies with 40, 50, 60 billion dollar market caps on publicly traded exchanges. And they have lobbyists at the Department of Energy in DC, and they still couldn't get approval for a small pilot plant 
for a liquid fluoride molten salt thorium, thorium reactor, which is next generation nuclear power, and it recycles old nuclear warheads. It doesn't create that much nuclear waste. The waste is only there for 100 years, and then it's all gone. It's basically um, not radioactive anymore. So I, I think a lot of the problem is not capitalism. The problem is not free markets. It's government and bad policy because the narrative is ESG. So solar, wind, biofuels, whatever these e uh, carbon cap and trade, whatever these ESG projects are, that's what all these rich parasites that are connected to the large corporations and the government have decided because then they can steal more money and funnel it to friends and family members who are sitting on the board of directors at these ESG companies. Sounds about right. I mean, that's what we got to deal with and i mean it's it's, it's sad to, to say the least because so many billions of dollars in my opinion are just being wasted and they're not going to the right places but again we it brings us back to what we talked about at the beginning which is when you have interest rates at rock bottom people put money where it shouldn't be and unfortunately the way i see this cycle turning is that in 2023 you know, at some point, maybe 2024, I mean, depending on the country, that we're going to start to see things change and they're going to reduce interest rates, perhaps due to a recession, whatever the case may be. And as a result, we're going to see some heavy levels of you know, malinvestment again. Inflation may just take off, even if, even if there's a some sort of recession and it's, everything's just getting worse than it is right now i think all the things we're talking about here is well, just getting worse i think the damage is just starting david with the bankruptcies for a lot of these companies so you had the pandemic shutdowns which forced a lot of businesses to shut down or go bankrupt but now with the higher interest rates you have other businesses that are either have either stopped growing they're going to start closing locations people are going to lose their jobs or if interest rates either stay at these levels for a while or they keep raising interest rates you're going to have a lot of bankruptcies and and then that's going to be a lot less uh, small businesses, a lot less jobs for people. So that's going to reverberate. We we haven't had that yet because interest rates have only been raised, what, for 12 months. But in the coming months, those higher interest rates are going to start to work their way through the private sector and consumer spending, and they're going to cause even more damage. I think it's going to be an, <laughs> an interesting 2023 as we move through this. I, I, I really think that um, what we're going to experience in the first quarter of 2023 is that a lot of the central banks around the world are going to start to basically hint that this is it for um, their rate hikes. And so as a result, we're going to see a lot of money being thrown into risk assets again, or, or the beginning of that. But I'm interested to see what happens with, um, in terms of recession, are we really going to start to see that fall into place is it going to be really heavy is it going to be mild and sort of uh, just long and drawn drawn out um that's going to determine sort of where we are from you know i would say second half of 2023 um but of course there's going to be a lot of companies that are going to be in real dire straits right now even even the things that were so fantastic so they claimed like um those eye buyers of houses uh where the houses were being bought up without even being seen, all done by computer algorithm and so on. Um, that's where technology meets real estate. And yeah, but look a at lot those. of these companies had to stop. Well, yeah, they they were losing money the more they tried to scale it. So you had like Redfin, Open Door, Zillow. They were trying to get into home flipping 18 months ago. And the more they tried to do it, the more money they, they lost. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't work. And of course, it probably can't work. Maybe in the future it will, but... Um, a lot of these companies started to realize, uh-oh, we're burning through cash here. Let's go back to what we are, and that is a tech company. And so they're trying to revert back. Tech companies have one advantage, and that's usually they've got large profit margins. So they have to utilize that and stay with what they are good at and what their businesses are strong at and not you know well spread yourself too thin a lot of these companies they spread themselves too thin maybe ftx was better at i don't know probably not but bad exam bad example but a lot of these companies were better at some point but they simply tried too many different things and got really really badly burned and it takes them down or we're kind of about to see that in the process of you know um higher interest rates being a problem. 
Yeah, we're having a Silicon Valley tech bus. Those companies are going to have to focus instead of just growing revenue and wasting capital because you had those uh, real estate companies. Well, they're they're just website listing companies like a Zillow or an Open Door. Those are real estate agents or Redfin companies. And then they tried to get into home flipping. Well, they don't have any competitive advantage in home flipping. They just had access to cheap capital for a while. And they're trying to take advantage of cheap interest rates and do kind of a spread or margin trade where they would be able to borrow with a cheaper cost of capital and flip homes and make a profit that way. But they didn't have any competitive advantage other than access to cheap capital. So they were losing enormous amounts of money trying to scale it up. You can't like, you can't defy the odds. I mean, this is crazy. Like look at these massive companies. Let's just take Amazon, for instance, it took them something ridiculous, like 15 years to start making a profit. Most companies cannot survive that long without actually being profitable, having cash flow. And everything. like it's just it just doesn't work like that. And so a lot of these companies are built around that mentality that as long as we just keep getting more debt, we can just keep going. Or selling shares to retail investors, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like don't 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 you know don't call, mess it up. Call Calpers, let's sell them more shares. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. As long as the pension, like the pension plan, the Ontario teachers pension plan over here, um, they bought into FTX. And so they lost that investment just gone. What, 400 like million or something? Wasn't it like 400 yeah, million? Yeah, I, I can't remember the number, but it was, a, it was a substantial sum. Like it's not, it wasn't nothing. You know? And it's just gone, zero. It's not as if it went down 20% or 50%. It's just gone. And, so, they, and they sold their, I don't know if you saw this, they sold their good package of royalties and streams that were cash flowing with a lot of growth. They sold it to Sandstorm Gold. So Sandstorm Gold bought... I think like six months before their FTX, um, it came out the news about their FTX losses. They had sold their um, royalty portfolio royalties and streams that were cash flowing with a lot of growth built in in the years <laughs> to come with, you know, high profit margins and cash flow. Sandstorm Gold bought that from the Ontario Pension Fund. And then I think the Ontario Pension Fund took those proceeds and and invested into FTX. Perfect. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like... <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. I mean, no investor's perfect and everything. But I mean, you just got to be, this is part of the pressure. It's that when these, these companies here, they're saying, you're not doing enough by, you're not investing in cryptocurrencies. So instead of buying Bitcoin and storing that, they're buying into these companies and they're really investing in shares of a company. You know, it's a totally different world. People are investing in Coinbase. Why? If you like Bitcoin, you should be buying Bitcoin. You should not be buying Coinbase. It's because of the way that this, these, you know, all these. I say it's greed. I say it's greed because they're trying to get extra yeah. leverage. So they're they're saying Coinbase that's, can that's scale. Fine, but... Coinbase can get more customers, but then they're only seeing the upside with the greed. They're not seeing any of the risks that these exchanges were doing accounting fraud. These exchanges were creating FTT tokens out of thin air and FTX was saying these tokens were worth a billion or $2 billion. And then when the Binance guy tried to sell some of them, you found out they were basically worth zero. <laughs> There's so many companies that are like this. So that's, that's the thing. We're, we're going to see a lot more of them, I do believe. I mean, it depends how in between today and when they start to cut interest rates drastically, which they'll probably bring them back down to zero again, during that period of time, it's going to be quite chaotic. And we'll hear more about these more companies. We'll probably do layoffs and this. But I do think that there's so much um, so, so much of a problem that we haven't really realized yet. And we're going to say, oh, there's a lot more Sam Bankman Freeds out there. But it's really a case of, you know, monetary history. Once we learn that and we realize this is part of a cycle, then we get get wise to it. Yeah, I don't know if you saw the Felix Zuloff interview that Adam Taggart over at Wealthion did. I've uh, been talking about this for months, though. But I think what we're going to see now, because of all these distortions and ch policy changes, rules changes, goalposts moving from governments and central banks, I think we're going to see much more asset price volatility in all these different asset classes and then also shorter boom and bust cycles based on government and central bank policies and rules changes going forward. So I think that's the new normal. That's basically what Felix Zuloff said in his recent interview, which is excellent. I highly recommend watching it with uh, Adam Taggart over at Wealthion. 
Um, I, I don't like to predict the future, um, but I can say that we're in for a wild one. And I do believe the ultimate desire of the Federal Reserve is to devalue the U.S. dollar into confetti. I mean, there will be a, there will be a day when when you use that for for party decorations, um, and that's probably going to be the way it goes. And then I, I I think that the end result will be the central bank digital currency uh, attached to a universal basic income. Um, and everybody's going to accept it because you have to. Inflation is so high, you won't be able to pay your bills unless you have that universal basic income. So we have a central bank digital currency that is connected, by the way, to one organization such as the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, who's already doing tests right now with multiple central banks. They're at the center. And certainly we could see that type of activity happening. And we might get a multipolar scenario where. China and you know BRICS nations have their own, and there's you know whatever this is going to be called with a biz at the center of you know sort of the Western one, and um, either way we know that there's going to be a lot less control, um, a lot more control I should say, and a lot less uh, sovereignty over your own wealth, over your just movement. Look at look at what happens in China. Yeah, and Dr. Klaus for the World Economic Forum, he's praised the Chinese Communist Party, Chinese government for their digital, their crypto yuan, and also their social credit score and says that the West, Western government should adopt that model and integrate those things. Well, David, I really enjoyed our discussion today. Kept you over an hour. My listeners want to follow your work, take a look at your YouTube channel videos, buy your book. How do they do so? Yeah, just search up The Money GPS. If you search The Money GPS, you see my face. I'm on all platforms, Twitter, every single day. I'm on uh, YouTube, of course, all over the place. I produce content every single day. And my whole message is about two things. And that's the pillars of prosperity uh, in no particular order. Pillar number one is about either self-sufficiency or off-grid living. Because if we're going to enter into a time where we have much higher inflation and we just can't keep up with it, if we're kind of going towards that self-sufficiency model, it doesn't really matter so much. And the second thing is you got an option, make much more income. Because if your income is, let's say, I don't know, we'll we'll make up a number of $1,000 a day or higher, that inflation doesn't hit you as hard as the average person. So you got those two options and you could do both of them, of course. And those people who who go in either one direction or both of those uh, are going to do much better than the majority. And that's just the way it works. So that's kind of what I focus all of my information around, the two pillars of prosperity. So when you come to my videos or see me on Twitter or any of the other platforms, um, just know that that's where my heart is at. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to speaking to you again in the next couple of months. Um, unfortunately, I think the roller coaster is going to get worse and more nauseating and we're going to have more levers pulling and rules changes and goalposts moving from governments and central banks going forward. So we're going to have a lot more content to produce because of all these different changes, but it's uh, the asset price volatility and other stuff is um, Felix Zuloff called it a roller coaster. And I would tend to agree with him. All you got to say is keep an eye on what the central banks do watch if their tone is changing and understand that it's all part of a playbook. You're going to see the same patterns all over the place. 2023 will be an interesting year.